So, you know, that project is a, it's a delicate game of these neighborhoods, you know, that plug in. And if you look at the project a little bit, you'll actually see those neighborhoods plugged in behind this skin of repetition. But it's really to give identity to these points along this incredibly long building. You know, would, would I suggest that we should all build kilometer-long repetitive buildings? You know, I, that really wasn't my choice because we were transforming this existing one. But I wanted to keep that sense of monolithicness. Yeah, basically the holism of the thing. Um, but in the sense of the World Trade Center model that you showed us with the uh, escape paths and how there are so many multiple combinations of them, and uh, what if you have to get a copy on the floor over here, yeah, and you're down just here, like what? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, we, our, you know, our egress consultant suggested that we would need electronics to describe all of the exit pathways. You know, you would need signs that would tell you when was blocked or not. You know, but it's a little bit, uh, complexity does, you know, sometimes produce confusion, but the point of it isn't to produce confusion, it's actually to produce holism and, you know, organization. <coughs> so. Uh, and also in the beginning, your second building, this uh, Spanish, I think it was, yeah. which looks really like a work of art from outside, I was wondering why you have not shown us something how somebody lives inside, you know? <laughs> Does it live like this inside too? Do I have walls which are huh? okay? Two, two or four do that. Okay, but it, right. But anyway, I thought to myself, yeah, and why should I expect uh, this kind of walls? You know, I should uh, grow up a little bit and become a little bit more crazy in terms of of uh, living. So it's not really a, a question. So I understand that they can also aesthetically uh, teach us not to expect what you call. Also, what vertical walls, or mm -hmm. what is the words for that? Yes, and orthogonal. And Gaudi, I have mean, been there last year, and this is kind of, it's really like, but you have to have a mind frame which is not very <laughs> widespread to live in this uh, kind of buildings. Nicht? I guess, I mean, there's. So what? Mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not a criticism. I'm, I'm totally for people changing their mind frames. <laughs> No, but there's a you know rich tradition. I mean, curiously enough, it's in Islamic architecture mm -hmm. and kind of pre-Christian architecture. But there, you know, there are a lot of traditions of thinking of space in terms of vaults and right. the Baroque. Uh, yeah. Certainly, yeah. we have in Germany some buildings, sure. which are so small but still interesting in their, in their way. Peter, I um, I was thinking about mass customization because it's hit almost every media right now, mm -hmm. especially um, very prevalent in fashion. There's a critique on it that says it's just capitalism's way of sort of keeping us into it, of, of really configuring saying, are you unique within it? And that's its way of uh, evolving. And I was curious what answer is on that. Well, but as to make it a better capitalist model, like the, like the coffee sets, for mm -hmm. instance. I mean, I thought, you know, there's no way you can sell a coffee set for $6,000. I mean, they're selling those things for $36,000 because the one-of-a-kind nature makes a coffee set into an art object. And so they're being collected by, you know, museums and collectors and stuff. They're completely turned into a commodity. Mm -hmm. So yes, the mass customization makes a piece of Miyake clothing seem like art, or seem like an investment, let's say, versus seeming like a functional pair of blows. Um, the other side of that is the toothbrush side of mass customization. You know, having to choose, I would actually say high velocity banality of the, that world of toothbrushes that is just completely disposable, you know, is more the enemy than making a coffee pot into an art object. I guess uh, for me. philosophically what I mean is um Instead of the, the counter argument, what's the counter argu argu argument of uh, defining ourselves as our products? In your, if, if we're actually living inside these things now, the, what's the sort of philosophical potential of this that you're looking for? I mean, you're not just doing it just to, to create mass customization. There must be some potential. <coughs> are you asking? Well, well it, it's subversive. Subversive. <coughs> is. I'm not going to use that word. I this is going to say it's going to really sound bad to you, but I actually would want to bring art into somebody's life <coughs> because the. I mean, for me with the Alessi set, 
there were two problems. One was how do we produce 50,000? And how do you make sure that every time you see one of those 50,000, you know it's one of mine? And you know it's the 2004 edition, so that if I do another set, they have an identity. Now, to me, the issue of mass customization is how do you keep identity and signature? Because if you have those things, you can have criticality. And how do you also make a thing which is adaptable and functional and fluid? That it hasn't really worked out. Most of the discourse about mass customization is it's going to satisfy people more because their desires can be projected into, the, into it better. So mass customized houses, you say, well, the person's going to design their own house and it's going to fit them perfectly, you know, like a glove. I actually don't think that's where mass customization is interesting. I think it's more interesting to bring a critical, provocative position into banal objects, whether it's by making somebody notice the architecture, which they would typically just walk right by and think of as an atmosphere, or whether it's kind of shocking somebody with a $3 ceramic fork. I mean, to me, I, I would think the critical artistic gesture is possible at a broader scale, but it's not as simple as, well, everything's going to be unique and everybody will have exactly the thing they desire. Because I, I just don't... There wouldn't be a world I want to live in where everybody was satisfied and projecting their desires without any architect or artist critically interpreting them. So, so as your colleague uh, thinks this novel, so this is this is idea that it's, uh, it's the information house and as it changes the structure through the people living there. It's not just this very limited choice in the beginning that they can be removes this wall, etc. I know nobody has ever built something like that yet, but is it in a, in a wider perspective something you would embrace that the building is not finished so one can really... Oh, sure. Yes, no? As long as I get to change the people in the house too. Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. You're totally right. It can go both directions. No question. Noah? Uh, That's in Valencia, Spain. Oh, sorry. Um, so there no windows. Yeah, no, it's that, what I showed you was yeah. the very first thing we it, started on. But it seems like uh, your very object based uh, architect. Mm -hmm. There isn't as much uh, interaction with the urban uh, surrounding. Well, if you take that project, yes, because what, what you saw was basically the month's work we did to propose the project that we're now working on. But, uh, but no, it has one of those volumes is a woven metal skin, which is more or less outdoor to the elements, and the other objects are masonry, and right now we're looking at them like arabesque screens, where they're all perforated, but they don't have punched windows. But I wouldn't necessarily say that, that mm -hmm. I'm doing object buildings. I mean, there, you, you'd have to go project by project. I mean, sometimes, yes. You know, like the thing in Costa Rica in the rainforest is an object building, but it's also colored and textured like a tropical frog and, you know, looks like a jungle. I mean, it's important to me that that is a jungle architecture because of its context, but, um, but you know, I, I do like to work context in a little, uh, sometimes in unpredictable ways. 